Thank you very much. Uh, well, now for something completely different, as they say. Um, earlier on this morning, you heard a commercial um, by um, uh, Professor Gross, a uh, commercial for um, quantum mechanics. Um, I think he must have, at some point in his career, done some selling of encyclopedia or encyclopedias or used cars. Um, but anyway, um, towards the end, he admitted that there were uh, some things which were not yet very well understood. And I think what um, I'm about to say may um, help to fill in these gaps. Um, no, is that? Yes. Okay. Um, you'll notice incidentally that of this um, great list of things which um, quantum theory could do very well, biology wasn't one of them. And in fact, um, there are problems with biology. Um, around about 1990, I had a paper in the journal Foundations of Physics, which um, called uh, Limitations to the Universal Universality of Quantum Mechanics. And nobody has yet said there's anything wrong with the argument. Um, but um, my premise, anyway, is that physics is based on mathematical descriptions, and these are themselves limited. Um, one problem is that uh, the, the usual approach um, involves some equation for time variation, and that uh, implies that you take a snapshot of the system at some very precise time, and you then use some mathematics to follow it forwards. Um, well, on the other hand, if there are these um, fluctuations, which are in fact infinite and have to be fiddled away, then taking a snapshot is meaningless. Um, uh, but, um, and in fact has led to a series of problems. So um, there's an alternative point of view I'm going to talk about, which um, perhaps one should associate mainly with the um, uh, ideas of John Wheeler, which I'll talk about in a moment. But I've, um, uh, the approach I've taken has been influenced by collaborator Alexa Yardley, who's written up something called Circular Theory, and I've been largely putting this into more rigorous form. But first of all, um, uh, well, the question anyway is whether we should ground physics on mathematics, which is the um, usual assumption in physics, or something which one might call creative observation, which I'll come to in a moment. It was Wheeler who introduced the idea of creative observation. Now, let me just say what problems the mathematical path has run into. Um, Uh, let me see if I can get this pointer to work. Um, I don't see anything happening. Um, anyway. Um, oh, okay, right. Oh, right. Oh, thanks. Um, okay, well, uh, it started off, the mathematical enterprise, you could say, started off with Newton, um, his mechanics, laws, mathematical laws, which described um, all sorts of things like the planetary orbits. Then Maxwell uh, did the same for electromagnetism. That, however, didn't, wasn't, ent wasn't entirely satisfactory and had to be replaced by quantum theory about 100 years ago. Then this was boosted to by quantum electrodynamics, which took the fields into consideration. Then the standard model, which um, applied, which worked quite well with many um, uh, describing a large number of particles. Um, now, the problem was um, integrating that with gravity, because um, this started uh, not being finitely renormalizable. Uh, but people did fix this eventually. There was a multi dimensional fix with um, things like strings and supersymmetry. However, uh, then the mathematics started to get disconnected from the physics. Um, the elegant mathematics and this dreamy of a final theory, but that um, didn't quite work out the way 
people expected. And one problem David Gross didn't mention is that there are an infinite number of, um, well, not infinite, 10 to the 520 different universes you get by folding up your extra dimensions in different ways. So there's a bit of a problem there. Uh, quite apart from a question of how do you mathematize biology and so on, which um, um, I won't go into here. Um, okay, well, then, um, around about 1990, um, John Wheeler wrote this amazing article, Law Without Law. If you, uh, you can find it with a search uh, with Wheeler, Law Without Law, and download it. Um, now, uh, what I have on this page is a, is a synthesis of a number of remarks made in that paper. He said, the scope of physics is greater than we once realized. If the elementary quantum process is an act of creation, as I'll come to in a moment, is an act of any other kind required to bring into existence all that is, including the universe. If the views we are exploring here are correct, one principle observer participancy suffices to build everything. So, uh, quite a dramatic claim. So let me um, say what his idea was. Um, well, it was based on quantum observation. Um, there's the theory of observation is part of quantum mechanics and uh, says we, um, to every observation, there's a certain observable and we collapse the wave function into an eigenstate around observable. So this is a kind of intervention in, in the world when we observe it. And it's something that can't be reduced to passive observation because, roughly because different kinds of observations do different kinds of things to a system. And so uh, uh, a classic example is if you have a beam of particles and you have a detector which observes where that particle is, then suddenly the beam collapses it into a point. Whereas if instead you uh, do some other, ob another observation like an interference experiment, that cannot be explained as a point particle but only as a wave. So there's something strange there. You, you sort of suddenly put a constraint on the system when you observe it. So he thought perhaps uh, that's all you needed to explain everything, but he didn't have a, um, a well-defined theory to explain that. In fact, uh, to get anywhere with this, you have to uh, think in terms of organized observation. Um, a disorganized observation is not going to do anything like make, uh, create some special kind of system. Um, in fact, Hameroff and Penrose introduced the idea of orchestrated collapse. They had the brain doing it. Whereas Henry Stapp had the idea that mind is not contained within quantum mechanics, and mind can do various interesting things. So, um, right, in the next slide, uh, sorry, I didn't switch to that slide, but anyway, next slide I have the quotes of Hameroff and Penrose, first of all. Uh, a network of microtubules can tune itself appropriately to achieve control of its own state of superposition and reduction. Henry Stapp had a much more esoteric idea. The conscious act is represented physically by the selection of a new top-level code, which then automatically exercises top-level control over the flow of neutral excitations in the brain through action of the laws of nature, etc., etc., and the unity of conscious thought, um, he thought, came into it, um, selecting a single code. So he has a more information theoretic approach. Um, uh, now I think this uh, needs to be extended a little further, but let me go through the. Um, sequence, as it were. Uh, traditional quantum mechanical uh, observation has deals with an isolated measurement and specified measurement or instrument. Now, we have technical devices which um, exert more control on nature, and you, they're using an organized set of measurements, and they are interactive. So any kind of gadget we have, which um, like a 
uh, a robot controlling something. That's making a lot of observations. And it's using these measurements in an organized sort of way. Uh, but those are not natural phenomena. So I turn now to biology and talk about biological systems, which do things like uh, uh, being adaptive. Also, what's very important, um, biological systems can aggregate together and join in activity. And this aggregate, aggregation is very important in the theory I'm talking about. They may also use of representations and use information. Okay, now, um, this is at the moment a qualitative theory. Um, I'll later on be describing two more rigorous things we've done, though uh, not applied to this specific theory, but I'm going to introduce a kind of metaphor, which interestingly enough links to string theory. Um, uh, and this metaphor, um, oh hang on, that's not, um, let me just have a look. Uh, no, so I haven't got to the dance metaphor yet. Um, Okay, I, I talked about systems self-organizing themselves to do, to do things, and I realized when I produced this title, slide title, Organization Through Activity, that it was very similar to Prigazine's order through fluctuations. Uh, Prigazine noted that when you get far from equilibrium or in a fluctuation, um, you tended to get interesting kinds of organization. And biological systems are doing the same kind of thing. Uh, they organize themselves through doing things. If, say, you learn to walk, then an organized structure gradually forms. And the way this does, basically, is that you, you add new possibilities. And if the new possibilities um, support that action, you join them to your system. And uh, you ignore uh, something you do which doesn't um, uh, doesn't fit in with that activity. So in fact, biological systems uh, naturally do this system, uh, this business of creating a unit which performs particular actions. So this is the kind of thing which we want to um, put into our model as being something fundamental. Um, so systems engage or disengage from actions as skills develop, so you get organized collections. An example of an organized collection where various models are flocking birds. And um, a student of mine did a similar thing through learning a skill of balance. And you might say roughly that the activity is a kind of reference frame to decide what should join in. And you, you produce a kind of condensate. But this uh, is a different kind of system to the physical condensate where you condense lots of versions of the same. In biology, you collect together things which cooperate together. Um, so now I'm going to um, make my grand assumption that there is a biological phase of reality um, where, roughly speaking, biological things happen. Now, one way to, um, to envisage this is to say that it's something on the border um, between two regimes that physicists think about, um, say, a, a collection of gas particles where these move in a pretty random way, that's one extreme, and the solid where you have a rigid structure is a different kind of situation. Um, in between, you can have a system where there's constraints combined with movement, and this seems to be the key thing. Um, so the idea, roughly, is that um, a thing we, which we haven't yet studied um, very much in physics, well, there is a, there's a, um, uh, a field of study called order of chaos, which studies some of this, but I think is missing out the biological aspect. Um, so you imagine things are moving about, and they form groups, and they disintegrate. And that's the kind of situation which is uh, really a new situation, with potentially new physics. Now, I have um, a video. Um, no, I haven't yet got to a video. Um, you think of it in terms of a, a dance, if you like. That's um, uh, people moving in a way that's constrained by the fact that they mustn't collide into each other. Some dances have this feature of joining together and splitting up, complicated um, 
choreography, um, subgroups form that exhibit ex organized movements. And uh, Yardley's theory proposes a, um, uh, two things circling around each other. Um, but also you might see um, David Gross's video of a, um, or of a um, moving string as being a kind of dance. Just to show you this business of, um, let's see if this is going to work. Uh, yes, I, good, I was going to turn off the sound. It's, uh, there was raucous movement in the background. These are Chinese motorbikes going around in organized patterns. It's just about a, a minute here. They change their form, and then a new object is introduced into the system. You'll see in a moment. They got up to four, but I'm only going to show you three of them. Uh, right, here we are, the third. This becomes a three-body system. And you have to find a, a new way in which the systems can move together. Uh, and they, they start off in a simple circling mode, but then it becomes more complicated. Uh, uh, right there. Instead, I introduced the odd jump in editing. So here there's a, a more complicated regime. So, uh, right, I'll uh, go on to the next slide. Um, uh, well, this, this illustrates a kind of new physics which I'm proposing. Um, coordinated action, there's also resonance. Um, there wasn't really resonance in that um, illustration, but um, you can have two, two systems each oscillating, and sometimes they lock into resonance. So this is a new kind of thing that can happen, which is interesting because it means that it's both two systems and one. You can um, picture systems as being a, a unit with a particular joint behavior, but in some situations, you can it's a useful model to think of separate systems. So uh, in, in Yardley's theory, you get um, groups forming and reforming. And now the point is that um, uh, this kind of thing can evolve. It, it will evolve if some systems have survived better than others or have greater value than others. Now this is if, if this develops, if this biological aspect develops, and I'll s say a little bit about how it develops in a moment. So really we're talking about new phenomena and a new perspective in things, which when um, uh, people have done a lot more work on it, uh, should give rise to new physics. And this, I, I believe, is what go is, will fill the gap that David talked about this morning. Then it's worth considering, it's an, a new concept and doesn't, have, doesn't really have anything artificial in it, like extra dimensions. It's just a thing that happens naturally. Once you have things, when you have things are moving, the movements are constrained, and units form and can, can dissolve. Well, now, the critical thing which makes biology different is evolution. More and more advanced structures appear through evolution, as various complexes form. And I, I just thought of a nice example of this uh, particular patterns for me is a chess game where you could say it's a kind of dance of a piece, dance of the pieces, but particular forms like the pin and the fork have survival value. Similarly, in this biological world, particular patterns have survival value, things like feeding and reproduction. Um, those are the natu natural things that happen in the biological realm. So, uh, what I'm proposing is that there are units which can form, as they form and reform, will uh, become more complicated forms and uh, eventually will be the explanation for physics. We'll get back to physics eventually. This isn't just biology. So, um, now, uh, we usually think of life as being something with a lot of complicated apparatus, um, DNA, um, molecules with specific properties and so on. What I'm proposing is that this, at some level beyond the standards model, say, we have something similar happen, a, a subtle biosphere. 
So this raises the question of what is actually needed to get biology underway. Um, and it's, in a way, it's like something lighting a fire. If biology can get going, then you can get these more and more complicated forms. Um, and I believe it's all needed. All that's needed basically is structures forming and dissolving, and a, a code, and a supportive environment. Um, one uh, one thing that's equivalent to DNA is um, well, you can think of DNA as being mutual templates. One of the strands is a template in which you form the complementary strand. Then they split up. The complementary strand is then a strand is then a comp is something a template on which the first strand can form again. In other words, you you don't really need very much to um, get uh, replication. Um, there just need to be these complementary structures will provide one mechanism for it. And then you get cumulative developments as rather as happens with software. And uh, now here's an idea as to what um, how you might get more and more complicated things developing. Um, well, first of all, uh, Signals. A signal is basically something which can connect with something else. So that's uh, uh, a simple one structure, well, two, two structures interacting that allows signals, and that includes semantics, what a signal means, syntax and language systems. Well, this, that's one development where things can get complex. And uh, the philosopher Suzanne Langer noted that symbols can work in two ways. One is more associated with science, you, where you use symbols to refer to something, whereas in, in art you have um, symbols which have particular effects. And I'll get into this because one of the things you get from this which you don't get in conventional, uh, the conventional approach is music. Um, well, okay, you can combine symbols to make propositions, so the idea of things being true and false um, occurs. From that, there's logic, which is connect the relationship between propositions. Then you can go to formal systems and mathematics, then things which satisfy mathematical laws and universes, and these universes can contain matter and life. So um, I'm fairly sure each of these steps could be um, studied with models. We did a model with one simple thing. So the idea is you um, find a system which can do something like deal with propositions, and then some combination of such systems might be able to do something useful like logic, which will be selected out. So just this uh, making more, more complicated systems with selection of those which are useful um, is going to give you in principle mathematics. And then you say um, what actually happens in uh, Culture is you develop mathematics, and then mathematical models to describe um, the surroundings, and then you can get to the work of designing things, and um, uh, you design things on the basis of mathematical laws. Um, and the universe is just um, a technology, you could call it, from based on this subtle life. And this, incidentally, will account for the um, uh, universe being supportive of life, because naturally the um, this subtle life is going to make things which have value to it. And presumably some forms of life could have value. Uh, so this is a bit like uh, the Penrose Triangle, I think, in one of his books, uh, Shadows of the Mind, I believe. It's the end of the book where he notes um, uh, physical systems. Mind is based on physical systems, and mathematics originates mathematics, and physics are based mathematical laws. Well, um, I don't. He didn't quite have that right, uh, because um, Hammeroff and Penrose thought that the only kind of mind you can get is a brain, whereas uh, one can perfectly well have these biological developments in more subtle systems. Um, so locating mind initially in the subtle biosphere clarifies the Penrose triangle idea. In fact, Wheeler's article assumes that the universe starts off as something which doesn't have life, but then it has observers, and observers can then work away shaping the universe. So this is uh, a bit, uh, essentially, the same kind of idea. 
Um, okay, so I say this is the real um, M theory and uh, may help to take us beyond where we are now. And now, uh, a little bit of controversy before I close. Well, I won't um, go into that. Um, oh, and I just mentioned space and music. Um, well, as in the um, modern approach, space is not something fixed. It may change dimensions and so on. So if we have an observer which can um, look at space, it can do some shaping on it. And so the idea is we don't get from uh, to our universe by some arbitrary folding up mechanism, but it's an organized process with a mind that went before space. Music, well, let me simply say that there are various things which I believe cannot probably be explained in terms of regular theory. Um, I did a collaboration with a musicologist, Tephis Carpenter. You can find our paper um, on our web pages if you follow the publications list. Um, and um, the, uh, well, a quote from our paper is, conventional theories do not account for the specificity, complexity, functionality, and apparent arbitrariness of musical structures. Psychologists who say this is what goes on in music do not explain things like that. But the kind of explanations we have been talking about will fit in with that, that's because um, you know, a code which can be functional. Uh, now, I said we have some things along these lines. Um, it's a paper by, Joseph, by myself and Hermann Hauser called Multistage Acquisition of Intelligent Behavior. That uh, explained the logic of development in terms of a picture like this. And uh, George Osborne did a, um, a thesis on the cognitive me mechanisms of guiding psychological development. And this was an actual computer program which took structures and assembled them, observed the way these structures behaved and was able to begin cognitive developments, and that was going nicely until the powers that be declared that he couldn't go on with us if he wanted to con continue as a student. Weird business. Um, templates, well, this is a concept which is useful for explaining how things develop. Uh, your, your simple structures act to organize uh, complicated behavior. So I... Um, I think this is the real M theory. Uh, now I'm getting on to the um, more controversial bit. Um, back in 1987, I wrote a paper for the journal Physics Education where I proposed that eventually physics and spirituality would be unified. Um, as you'll see, it's quite similar to this, but it's, it's taken quite a time to put that into a, uh, to clarify what was going on. Um, that uh, there'd be the subtle level um, and um, then I said this would actually connect with religion, so scientists might have problems with this. Um, okay. Um, the various things, Eastern philosophy, um, which is really, was really my starting point, that mind is the base of, uh, basis of everything. Um, I read a book by uh, a theologian, Keith Ward, which actually explained creation in terms that matched very well the view that I was getting for my own approach. Then there's intelligent design. Now that's very strange and political because to be a scientist you have to take as an axiom that intelligent design is wrong and expend all your efforts on one side. Now, um, in fact, um, admittedly, uh, the creationist people are interested in this, but they made the decision to see what could be got from science. And intelligent design is in fact an entirely scientific enterprise. Stephen Meyer is... Um, Philosopher with an, a philosopher with an Im impeccable uh, pedigree, uh, namely a, a PhD from Cambridge. Um, he's written this book, Signature in the Cell, uh, which discusses the science. Um, he's saying how um, its cells have a remarkably complicated structure and it's hard to see how these could be produced. Whereas on my picture, the subtle level um, is able to experiment with designs and get better and better ones. So it's not constrained by the universe. Now I see that my time is almost done, which is good because uh, this last slide is the end. Um, I'm the sheep that are separated from the other sheep as shown in this um, painting by my wife. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you.